Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Strength for Today. With your host here, Eric Dykstra. Today, we're going to dive in to what it means to be made new. And there's two places that Paul talks about becoming a new creation and living from the new life that we found in Christ. And that's in Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 4. And these are going to be our two primary focuses today. And there's two different Greek words that he actually uses, which correlates this idea of living from the new creation that we've become. So we're going to dive into those in a few minutes here. But as we think about the life of Paul overall, for the last week and a half, we've looked at the transformation that's happened. And maybe for some of us, we've looked at the life of Paul and we've just been fascinated or enamored in such a way that really creates a false hope for what we can become. We think that maybe we've got to have this Paul experience that's uh, so dramatic and um, maybe you've heard a testimony from a person that, you know, they were doing all these um, bad things and then all of a sudden there was this sudden epiphany and realization and it was like all their transformation happened in one moment. And that can be very discouraging. It can lead you to live from a place of despair and, and uh, no hope and being frustrated, being anxious, being fearful that maybe I just can't experience that kind of transformation. The last episode, I encouraged you that I believe that transformation is much more uh, reachable and attainable than what we often give credit to. And it's like the life of Paul we can look from to be an example. But when you look at the life of Paul, there were so many things that led into him coming to know Christ. And there were significant people, uh, there were experiences that he had that really led him into knowing who Christ was. And so it was establishing that new life um, and, and learning to walk in the wisdom that he had been directly uh, given access to through his relationship with Christ. And so here's one of the images that I want to give you just to think about like I've said before, God often speaks to me in images. And when I think about the life of Paul, um, one of the, uh, the closest ways that I can describe what we're going to read here in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4 is the transformation that happens between a uh, caterpillar going from being a caterpillar into being a butterfly. And many of us who've been in school, we've learned about this process. Maybe you even went and got one of those caterpillars and um, put it in this little, you know, mini greenhouse or where it got some leaves with it. And, you know, you watched it transform and make a cocoon. And then all of a sudden one day it breaks out of that cocoon. And that whole process is really fascinating. And really to me is one of the greatest illustrations that we have of when we give our lives or our hearts to Christ and we begin to live in the newness of what God has made us because there's something that happens in inside of us where no longer are we about ourselves and creating an image, but we become secure in who Christ is and what he's done for us. Because when a caterpillar actually goes into a cocoon and falls asleep, it literally dies in the cocoon and disintegrates into nothing. And it has to reinvent or reform itself. And I don't know how that happens. It's beyond my comprehension, but it happens. Yeah, I did even some research this morning on it just to confirm and make sure that it actually disintegrates into nothing, almost like uh, in uh, like this ooze, and then it remakes itself. And this is what's even fascinating about that whole process is that if you actually try to help uh, a butterfly break the cocoon when you start to see the struggle, the struggle of the cocoon uh, and how it was built actually provides a way for the butterfly to move its wings and begin to build strength in its wings. And if that butterfly is given help and that cocoon is removed, that butterfly is actually never going to be able to fly because it didn't develop the strength that it needed from breaking the cocoon and moving its own wings. 
And that to me is really a beautiful depiction of what the Lord does when we invite him uh, in our moment of weakness or brokenness and humility, and we invite him in, is a lot of times we just want others to deliver us or um, to, to help get us out of a situation, to be rescued out of a situation. And the way that I've discovered God meets us is that he actually comes into our world through very difficult circumstances or times in life and really just um, draws us to himself. And if we try to avoid and build a lifestyle that's free of conflict, free of struggle, we're not going to build the strength that we need in order to fulfill and live into the destiny that God has called us to. Because when you go through something extremely difficult and hard, I've shared several examples in my own life of the struggles and what they produce. And at the time, I wasn't glad or grateful to go through it. But I've come to a point in my life where I've learned to be very grateful. And I've looked back at experiences and what they've added to my life. And I wouldn't be the person today that I was back then. And really who I am today and what you see of me, the gifts that I've developed has all been part of God's process of transforming me more into his image. Because the person I was five years ago isn't the person I was even two years ago. And the person I was two years ago isn't the person that I am today. And that's that growth mindset that, you know, I try to live my life by. It's what Paul did is he had examples. He had an encounter with Christ and uh, he wasn't just going out and, and teaching people about who Jesus was. He was first a worshiper of God himself, and through his worship, through his study, through his times of prayer, God was sharing himself with Paul so that he could give himself uh, fully to the calling that God had over his life, and that's a lot of times the way he works in our lives personally as well. So that image of a butterfly is just one that I wanted to start with today to really give you a picture of what happened in the life of Paul. And I can guarantee you that if you look back through the course of your life, maybe you could see that in yourself as well. Um, because that's what I'm encouraged about when I read through scripture and when I listen to testimonies of believers who are seasoned and experienced in life is that the commonality that we all have is that the struggles are who uh, are the things that make us who we are. And Paul's life just didn't become real easy. Uh, even in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives a summary of all the things that he suffered uh, after he gave his life to Christ. But yet he was grateful. And he said in Philippians 3, as kind of the summation of his life, that all these things that I've once considered great and that I pursued no longer mean anything and carry no weight because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus in my heart. And to amplify it in verses um, Philippians 3.10, it says that it's a progressive journey of growing more into intimacy uh, with God himself. And so I love that translation where it talks about uh, it's a progression. It's not, it doesn't just happen one time overnight, but it's a continuous process of us growing in, in Christ and making himself more fully known to us that moves us into the next thing that God has for us. So a recent example I saw uh, of this we're in a time right now where we're watching the Olympics and one of the, I always love just listening to the stories of, of what's happened and what athletes are, are doing what, but it's the backstories that often make their success so meaningful and so um, moving and touching for us. And a few days ago, I actually heard the story of two of the American women speed skaters and this was a really fascinating story because there was a young lady, uh, I think her last name was Jackson, was an African uh, American woman, um, young lady who was trying to get into the Olympics during the trials and actually didn't qualify. And the other speed skater who had been more seasoned, who was more decorated, actually did make the trials for this one or did make the Olympics for this event. 
And she ended up actually giving her spot away so that this young lady could be uh, get into the Olympics and have a shot at winning the gold and being the first female black athlete to win a gold medal. And there was kind of an ongoing relationship between these two. But the fact um, that Jackson said that this older seasoned veteran would give up her spot in order to give me a chance to show the world uh, what's inside of me was really meaningful for her. And so she had the chance to compete. And we all know that she won the gold uh, for, for speed skating and was the first ever uh, female Black African woman who uh, won an Amer uh, a gold medal. And that was just one example of the kind of lifestyle that gets developed um, that we see modeled even in the life of Paul. Because in Philippians 2, one of my favorite passages, Paul talks about the example that we have in Christ and how Christ was sent as an example for us to model our lives after. And so Paul was looking to Christ for everything that he was accomplishing in his life. And even in that Philippians 2 passage, it talks about putting others first and, and not making our lives about us, but getting to a point where we've received the love of God so that we can love the people around us. And that's the point Paul had come to live his life from. And that was an example uh, that I just shared and saw as a modern day reality of this mentality of serving other people. And being willing to sacrifice things in our lives so that others could have an opportunity and an experience. And that really was the summation of Paul's calling is that he was sent into all these cities to work and to build these foundations for churches. And he worked alongside of them. It even says at certain times that he was a tent maker. So a lot of the income that he uh, raised was from his hard work and using his hands but yet he helped build spiritual foundations as well in these cities. And he made uh, the call of his life and the purpose of his life to really help establish everything that's made available to us in Christ and that he had personally experienced. And so let's dive in to Colossians chapter three. This is the first place that Paul talks about being a new creation in Christ. And I'm going to start at verse five. And he talks about the new creation life. And for the word new creation he uses here, it's actually the word neos. And neos actually means to put on the most recent version of yourself. And so it reemphasizes that our relationship with Christ is ongoing, that it's progressing, that who we were yesterday um, isn't who we are today because of the things that God has shown us. And we're always living in front of the face of God and he's changing us, making us into a new image. And it's this ongoing process of becoming new in our current situations and being moved into the creation that is still evolving and still emerging for the days ahead. But listen to the words of Colossians chapter three, starting at verse five. This is the Passion Translation. He said, live as one who has died to every form. And then he gives a list of things like sexual sin, impurity, live as one who has died to diseases, the desires for forbidden things, um, the desire for wealth of idol worship. And then in verse seven, he says, that's how you once behaved, characterized by your evil deeds. But now it's time to eliminate them from your lives once and for all anger, fits of rage, all forms of hatred, cursing, filthy speech, and lying. He says, lay aside your old Adam self with its masquerades and disguise. This is that whole neos where Paul is saying, step into the new creation that you've been. When we give our lives to Christ, we are made new and we are reborn in our spirit and our spirit comes to life. And he says, all these former ways are now dead. I once heard a guy say, and this was kind of humorous, um, you know, he said, the fact that you're dead means don't just play dead, 
but stay dead. And that's really the mentality that we have in the Christian life. It doesn't mean that um, life isn't going to be full of adventure and joy that, you know, being dead is kind of this legalistic religious way of living where you don't have the freedom and the permission and the joy and the peace and the balance, the maturity, uh, the fulfillment, you know, that we talked about in the last episode. No, it just to me, it means just the opposite. The things that limit us, the things that keep us stuck, the things that keep us immature. He's saying those things have died. Christ took them away at the cross and we were buried with him in his death. That's why baptism is so significant for a believer and what it signifies and symbolizes. It's really a symbolic way for us to acknowledge that the old parts of myself, I'm now burying with Christ. When you go under the water, it's submerging yourself and saying, I'm dying to the old nature. And when you come up out of the water, you're given new life. And now you're acknowledging and identifying your life in Christ, not the old self, not the old Adam it talks about here, but he says the new emerging you, the neos you he's talking about. The word neos also means regenerated or the most recent form or in uh, to um, the new in me right now that is progressing. Those are all definitions in the Greek of what that word neos means that he's using right here. For listen to verse 10, it says, for you have acquired new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you, giving you the full revelation of God. Is that not incredible news? For me, it just brings life as I hear it and as I read it out loud and as I hear it, my heart just begins to be filled with joy and I feel the sense of being a much loved child. Listen to it again. For you have acquired new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you. You're constantly, every situation, you're becoming more like Christ if we're responding to the new creation that Christ has put within us. And it says, giving you the full revelation of God. Just take some time to ponder that today and in the days ahead. The full revelation of who God is in us and for us. Then you flip to one of his other letters to the church at Ephesus and in Ephesians chapter four, which if, uh, the book of Ephesians, uh, the letter to the Ephesian church is just so full and rich of God's love and his grace being poured out and our foundation being Christ and in Christ. And in Ephesians four, he uses a very similar um, passage to what he wrote in Colossians verse um, three. But the word for new creation or the new life that he talks about is a different word. In Ephesians 4, it's the word kainos, which kainos actually means fresh or new in quality, in nature, completely new and different from a heavenly realm. So as you listen, as I read Ephesians 4, I want you to think about that definition, that definition, completely new. It's like the caterpillar can becoming something completely new and now having new abilities to be able to fly. It's like a new creation, something completely new that's from the heavenly realm. That's what God calls us to be in this world as his representative around um, to the world around us. So I'm going to read Ephesians 4 and verse 17. It says, so with the wisdom given to me from the Lord, I say, you should not live like the unbelievers around you who walk in their empty delusions. And it talks about their corrupted logic has been clouded because of their hearts are so far from God. But in verse 20, he goes on to say, but this is not the way of life that Christ has unfolded within you. He says, if you have really experienced the anointed one, and heard his truth, it'll be seen in your life. For we know that the ultimate reality is embodied in Christ. 
And I love that because that's what Paul carried throughout his ministry and his calling. He says, if you've experienced Christ, take it back to that time when he was on the road to Damascus. Paul encountered Christ that day. And for three days, he couldn't see a thing. And when Ananias came to him and laid hands on him and prayed over him, those scales were removed and the light flooded into his heart and into his spirit and in his thinking and all parts of the old nature were gone. And it was a new day for Paul and he began to walk and see things. And, and I always say that when you're talking about the new creation, you should see trans evidences of transformation in the ways that you see things in the things that you hear. And in the ways that you speak, and you see that throughout Paul's life, is that there was a radical transformation that happened. And it wasn't all at once, but it was a progression. And as Paul continued to experience Christ for himself, he began to give it away to other people. And other disciples came around him and helped him and sharpened him and cut off the rough edges and had to move past some of the fear they had of Paul but they accepted him. They gave him permission. They gave him freedom to go into places that they knew they weren't called to reach. And that's the beautiful picture of so many of Paul's writings is he wasn't just talking about the revelation he had, but his life actually demonstrated to the world around him all these incredible revelations and ways that he had experienced Christ and he wasn't just doing it to build himself up or to build his ministry, but he truly wanted others to know Christ because it had so changed his life. And there was no other way that he was going to be willing to walk. He wasn't going to compromise anything in his life. And that was the line he drew in the sand saying, I'm not going to live according to what I was. Because for so many of us, and I've walked through seasons of this myself, where our failures, our mistakes, and, and our mind goes to all the places that we're not and who we're not. And yet God isn't like that. Paul said in Romans 12, there is, there, there is, there, there is now no condemnation in those for those who are in Christ and those who love Christ. You see, guys, God doesn't condemn us out of our old self and said, look what you're not. That's the enemy. But God, on the other hand, speaks life. A few weeks ago, we talked about all the I am statements that Jesus said. I would, go, I would encourage you to go back and revisit those. When God comes, he honors you. He values you. He sees you for who you are. And he calls out your true identity because he wants you to become like him because he knows that if you become like him, you get to experience the world as he designed and intended it to be. And so his heart is for your heart to be restored and then reconciled back to him in relationship so that you can fulfill the calling of your life, that you can experience everything that this life has and in the life to come. When Paul was mentoring Timothy, he said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he said that, um, earthly training or physical training is of some value in this world, but spiritual training brings godliness, which is eternal, which gives you the ability now to walk with people and impact them on an eternal level and not just in the physical world around you. That was the favor and the grace that Paul had in his life to bring others into a relationship with Christ. And that was the heart and the motivation of who Paul was. And it didn't come without incredible sacrifice and uh, um, sacrifice and suffering. And Paul says that It'll be seen and evident in your life. He said that the ultimate reality is embedded, embodied in Jesus. And he has taught you to let go of the lifestyle of the ancient man. There's that word, kainos, 
which means put on the most recent self. So here Paul's saying that he says to let go of the ancient man, the old self life, which was corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires. And that springs up from delusions and deceptions. He says, now it's time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you. I believe that's what Paul modeled. That's what Jesus modeled was that when he walked and did the things that he did and he spoke the way that he did, it was because of the direct revelation that he was getting from his father and seeing in the spirit what his father was wanting him to accomplish and set his time, energy, and efforts to. He was about his father's business. And he says, and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness, and you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. Who man, do you feel that? I feel it as I'm hearing it, just being read out loud, to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within. Father, I'm asking in this moment that you would give us a revelation of who you are in your fullness, Lord, and that as you pass before us, that our faces would shine and glow as we see you and hear you and watch you do what only you can do, that we embrace the glorious Christ within our new life and live in union with him. I'm praying that your life would fall into union with him, that there would develop and be cultivated an intimacy that would bring you deeper into his truths in the spirit and in your heart, in the ways you think and the words that come out of your mouth that reveal what's in your heart, that it would be full of light, full of life, he says, for God has recreated you all over again, just like that butterfly who being transformed from being a caterpillar. Now it's got the ability and the strength and its wings to fly above things, to live in victory. Guys, that's the revelation that's coming from this word right now to be made new, to be whole in this moment and respond in this moment, guys. And he says, so discard every form of dishonesty and lying so that you will be known as one who always speaks the truth for we belong to one another. And I love how he ended that, that, that passage right there, that we will be people of truth and that we belong to each other. To be a person of truth taught, takes an intentionality, a joyful intentionality of getting his word inside of us, of manifesting his presence of being able to connect with him on a daily basis that sets us free guys and that's accessible in the person of jesus and the holy spirit has been given to bring you into the fullness of what god has in and for your life and i'll close this session with this and I'll point you in the direction of Romans chapter six through eight. This is the great place. And I would encourage you to read this, uh, these passages every month. Romans is an incredible book by itself, probably one of Paul's most theological writings, because for chapters one through 11, it talks about um, theology and it talks about who God is in what happens in our lives when we give our lives to Christ. And then from verses 12 or chapters 12 on, it becomes very practical of living it out. Tying it back to last one where it talked about salvation, talking about coming into relationship with Christ and what happens. Chapter 12 of Romans kind of goes into that wisdom of how to live it out, how to walk it out with him on a daily basis. But Romans 6 through 8, Paul makes a statement in Romans, uh, it's either five or six. He says, you are now alive to the things of God and dead to sin. In Romans eight, he says, the person who sets their mind on the spirit is uh, brought to life. There is a sense of life and peace for those that set their mind on the spirit. 
and draw their identity and character from the spirit. But those who set it on the flesh and live from the flesh, death comes in. And the image that the Lord gave me just a couple of days ago, I was just kind of, I saw this picture of two magnets. And I can remember being a kid in science where there's two ends, there's a North and a South pole to each magnet. And when you would put uh, ends towards each other that would repel, there's no way that you'd be able to touch them. And, you know, you turn it around one end and you put it and they, those ends attract. And the Lord, I don't know why, again, the Lord just speaks to me in images a lot of times. The Lord just said, this is a lot of times what happens in terms of learning to walk in the spirit and live uh, being alive to Christ is that when you give your life to Christ, you begin to be drawn um, to, to truth and to righteousness and um, to living life according to the way God designed it to live. And so uh, all the things that are of God now start to attract to you and you start to inherit the promises and the fulfillment of the calling that God has put on your life. Because you're, um, it's like a magnets that attract. You're attracted to the things of God. You're attracted to who he is. And you begin to attract the good things in life. And you become a dispenser of those good things of what you experience in your relationship with Christ. But when you're opposed to the things of God and you're rebellious or you're, you're following other gods or you know, whatever it is that's keeping you from that life-giving relationship, you're going you're, you're gonna to be repelled by the things of God. That's why Paul said in Corinthians, uh, to some, you might be a stench of death as a believer because they're opposed and they're walking in the darkness. They're walking opposed to the truth and they want nothing to do. And when you, Christ, the light, the salt come into their world, it challenges them. And it's not that they reject you, but they reject the truth that's in you. And that person is Christ. They reject the light because they want to continue to live in darkness. And until their heart is softened, you don't have that opportunity to bring them into the closeness uh, through relationship with Christ. You see, that's the beauty of how uh, God works in us. And that's what happens in Romans 6, 7, and 8, is you see the contrast of what Paul used to be and how he used to persecute the church. And then in chapter 8, you see, this is who I am now. And just, man, Romans chapter 8, I've read through it so many times in life, and there's so many things that I pull from it. But it really gives you a beautiful picture of walking in the spirit and living out of the, the kainos that he talked, Paul talked about in Ephesians 4, and the neos, the new you that's emerging every day. So I just want to end this episode, and I just want to speak to you and speak to the new identity that God's put in you, because you are no longer what you used to be in the past. And the Lord says to you today, rise up, child, awaken, O sleeper. I call forth your spirit through the power and the authority of Christ within me. Christ says to you, awake, let the light of the goodness of who I am come into your heart, into your spirit. And I just pray that today God would give you an image of who you really are in the new creation that he's created you with. And I just want to invite you to do a simple exercise and just ask the Lord, what do you see in me? And what do you say over my life? And just listen. Knock and you shall, it shall be open. Ask and you shall receive. Guys, his heart is to reveal him, his self to you. And he wants to reveal who he's made you to be. And so I would just invite you, ask him, what do you say of me? What do you see in me? And just begin to write those things down. And then begin to declare them over yourself so that your heart can begin to believe and trust that, does this sound like God? Is this what I saw in scripture through the lives of all those that have gone before us, have experienced the Lord and what the Lord would say to them and how the Lord changed them? Because God 
is congruent with the words that he spoke in scripture. He's congruent with his message. What that means is that his word that we read about in the lives and the testimonies that we hear, even today and from those who've gone before us, are congruent. The message is congruent with who they are. God's word is congruent with who he is and who he wants to be. And I just see an image of a bridge closing that gap for so many of you that he's moving you from your past and, and just almost um, se severing that road back because so many of us want to go back and say, that's who defines me. But no, the Lord says to you today, you are made new. And I need you to respond to the new creation that I've created you to be today. And a new bridge is being built into your future for you to walk into. And the Lord doesn't just send you out ahead of crossing that bridge, but the Lord is walking with you across that bridge into your future. And he's smiling, his arm around you, speaking words of wisdom and love. And when the battles come, He's lifting you. He's strengthening you. His heart is being formed in you, just like Paul's was. As he went out, guys, he was established in that foundation of Christ. There were times where he went out not knowing, I'm sure, what was ahead, or if he was even going to make it to the next destination that God had called him to. But by faith and obedience, he stepped out. And as he stepped out so many times in faith, God met him right where he was at and added more to his message, added more of the revelation of who he was for Paul. And that's the same thing that he'll do for you today. It's the same way that he's walked with me for, for all of my life and continues to and has created a great expectation and hope that he's going to continue to do that in the future. So be encouraged by the life of Paul. Know that no matter where you're at, your days ahead are going to be bright and filled with hope. And he's working in you and he's worked in your past and bringing you into a place of greater belief, greater expectation, and greater hope through who he's created you to be and who he wants to be for you today. So be strengthened today and in the love and the peace and the joy of our Lord. I pray that you would just be filled with his presence today. Come back and join me on Friday as we're going to dive even deeper into some of Paul's writings and even share some stories with you about how the Lord has strengthened me in some very difficult times um, that's really resembled who I am today. So God bless, God strength, and we'll see you next time.